For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. Okay, looks like we are live, guys. Uh, I appreciate your patience, but I promise you this is going to be this is going to be worth it because we've got an awesome show for you today. And I have to say, it is an honor to have Dr. James Carter and Dr. Ryan Hayes here with me for a discussion on this incredibly important topic. Uh, these men are, are both incredibly brilliant and highly knowledgeable. I have to say, I am especially glad I am on their side because the the topic of today is. Resolving the Chemical Origins of Life Paradox, Part 1, featuring Dr. James Carter and, and Dr. Ryan Hayes. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, uh, for being here and, and giving us your time for this important show. Glad to be here. Awesome, awesome. Well, since this is the first part of an ongoing series, we're going to keep it about an hour. Uh, I'm going to give a brief introduction to these brilliant men of God, and, and then I'm gonna hand it over to them to expand or elaborate on my brief introduction. Correct me on, on anything, of course. Uh, to Dr. James Carter has a BS in biology from California State University and a PhD in biochemistry from Loma Linda University where he has been teaching for the past decade. Dr. Carter has also taught 15 different science courses including biology, microbiology, cell biology, immunology, pathology, advanced nutrition, general chemistry, organic chemistry, and biochemistry. Um, so thanks for being here, James. And I'll give uh, Dr. Hayes a quick introduction and then I'll hand it over to you guys. So Dr. Ryan Hayes is a professor of chemistry and has a PhD from Northwestern University Evanston. Hope I said that right. No, Evan, um, Evanston. Evanston. Okay, yeah. Evanston. <laughs> and a BS from Andrews University. And you've been uh, researching signal amplification and compositional analysis of nanotechnology, materials based on dendromers. Mm -hmm. And you have also spent nearly a decade working in industry. Yep. And um, your experience includes business development, patent portfolio management, and scale up of chemical-based technologies within the life science reagent, personal care, agriculture, uh, coatings, and polymer additive industries. Um, so thanks for, for being here, gentlemen. Um, I'm going to hand it over to you if you want to elaborate or, or correct me on anything. I did put your information in the description box as well. Uh, but thanks again. And if you guys would like to elaborate on anything that that I said, go ahead. Great. Uh, are we, are we, I'm going to let James just say a few more things if you'd like. Um, is my screen being shared there or do we have to, do I have to click something here? No, I can do it right now. Yeah, go ahead and uh, pop. There we go. James, are there any other introductory comments you'd like to make or? Oh, I think that's enough flattery for one day. <laughs> I did want to say that I, I really enjoy uh, working with Ryan. Uh, he and I, um, we haven't met in person, but we meet each week online uh, with uh, um, Rob Stadler and a, a couple of other scientists. And we're working on some uh, uh, easier to understand animations. We borrowed an animator from the Discovery Institute and we're, we're currently working on scripts for uh, about a half a dozen videos. Um, so if the chemistry is a little too intense for you and in this series, you know, you'll be able to follow along nicely with our uh, short and humorous uh, videos that will help explain some of these problems. So stay tuned for that. And uh, uh, next year, we're we're about done with the script on the first video, and um, hopefully, we'll get that uh, out in the next couple of months. So yeah, I really enjoy working uh, with Ryan. He's a great guy. So I uh, likewise awesome. uh, back to you, James. Uh, I just want to say that we, James and I actually met um, 
for the first time on this program when I was uh, that's right the other time, and he was he was helping me out. Uh, You're a matchmaker standing for truth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I appreciate that, you guys. Um, and just uh, just a little bit more about me. I, that was a great introduction. Thank you. Um, not not to toot my horn. I'm just uh, I've been thinking about you know, how our world is designed. Yeah, that was a great introduction. Thank you. Sorry, I'm um, not not to toot my horn. I'm just uh, I've been I got thinking sorry. About how, you have another window open somewhere? Uh, I'm trying to kill it. I don't know. Uh, it could be another window open. I guess we'll figure it out and come back. But uh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, so probably, what we're going to do is add a window. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Go um, ahead, Dr. Carter. Um, uh, maybe I'll get some headphones too, so it's not as much of a feedback or echo. Um, so yeah, what we're going to do today, I uh, hope he can come back because we kind of compiled our information onto his PowerPoint. <laughs> so I don't have a copy of it. Um, uh, uh, there he is. Yeah. Oh, am I unmuted? Sorry about that, you guys. No, no you're, you're good. Know. You're good. We're happy to have you back. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to start the screen share here again. All right. All right. A little, a little, uh, okay. I thought I should have closed the other window early on. Okay, so well, I just want to say, yeah, thank you. I just want to say real quick that it's really since about 2012, I've been thinking about how the chemical design of the world is taking place and some of that's going to play in into this. So uh, I've made molecules. Uh, I feel like I, I have a sense of how things are made and from doing it, not from reading about it, not from uh, listening to other people. I've been in the lab. I've made some pretty advanced molecules uh, things that re resemble things found in nature, uh, uh, brand new things, nanomaterials. Uh, so I'm not saying I'm an expert in all things. I'm just saying, I, you know, I, I kind of have some practical experience with that in, in dealing with these things. So, but today to kind of launch in for today, uh, I don't know, is there anything else um, for the introduction or should I go into our introduction for today? Well, we should point out that this is going to be a multi-part series where we'll we'll dissect one or two papers per session. So it's going to be an ongoing destruction of abiogenesis. Kind of we're, we're setting the uh, the charges on the <laughs> on the building and we're we're blowing up each foundation at a time until there's <laughs> there's uh nothing left. <laughs> I like yeah. it. I, I, I yeah. love the way you put it. And uh, I'll say one thing, uh, Dr. Hayes, and then the floor is yours. Um, okay. Tag me with your questions, guys, at Standing for Truth. Uh, relevant questions to to the topic at hand, and we'll have a Q and A uh, after the, the the presentation and talk here. And we're going to try and keep it within an hour because, as um, James was saying, this is going to be an ongoing destruction. So, uh, anyways, enough for me. The floor is yours, gentlemen. I'll just go ahead and get her started here. Uh, there's two papers that we've looked at. We've been looking at uh, lots of papers. Uh, it, it's there's just so many papers that are emerging in this area. And so we thought uh, these would be two good places to get started for today. The first one that we'll look at is atmospheric prebiotic chemistry and organic hazes. And uh, uh, of course, that's a play off of my last name. But uh, so that's not the only reason why we picked it. So these are found online and uh, most people can get a hold of them. The second one is prebiotic nucleoside synthesis, the selectivity of simplicity. So uh, we really uh, want to just kind of we're not going to dive too terribly deep into the papers. We're going to look at some key points that are brought out and how they they actually kind of destroy themselves. So uh, I found that kind of interesting um, how they, they kind of take themselves down. So our first one we're going to look at is atmospheric prebiotic uh, chemistry and organic cases. This is what was the atmosphere like in, in the early Earth? because this is the source of many of the chemicals that are needed to generate life from nothing, from the ground, from the water, from the air. So it's really the, the air composition is extremely important. And you know, I would, it feels like this is something that's been settled and solved. Well, that's not what the research shows. That's not what these papers are illustrating. So we wanted to bring that out. And I think it's important uh, to put this all in context, and I'm going to use Rob's uh, stairway metaphor here. And in his book, The Stairway to Life, uh, Change and Rob talk about the stairway of how you, these pieces have, the pieces have to get made, the ingredients. 
And then they have to be the right ones with the right chemistry. And you have to solve the water problem. And it's just build up before you get to the biological uh, life that we're so interested in trying to generate. And these papers that we're going to talk about and all of and most of abiogenesis were really stuck way down here. And in fact, this paper is almost before the stairs get started. It's the, the chemicals in the air and how they can contribute to life. So we got to remember. So they're not solving the problem. They're not solving the problem how chemistry goes to biology. They're trying to solve making some of the ingredients. And is it plausible? That's what we're trying to see. Is it is it really uh, and is there some consensus in the scientific field in this area? Now, just just one other thing about uh, I've been I've been looking at the atmospheric composition of Earth's uh, air right now in the current form. And I have a number of talks on this um, dealing with the fine tuned nature of the amount of air that we have, the amount of oxygen, carbon dioxide and um, how that relates to water and how uh, our Earth traps water. Um, how our earth deals with radioactivity and how air intersects with that. And then also um, uh, my, the big clencher is why do we have nitrogen, dinitrogen, this triple bonded molecule in our air, what's so good about it? And I call it the most overlooked molecule. So I've been thinking about this for a while. I'm not saying I'm an expert. I've got a lot to learn in this area, but there's some things that are just amazing about our earth, uh, about earth's air and how it's finely tuned uh, to block uh, dangerous things like comets and to block uh, dangerous output from our sun. And yet it lets just the right amount of light through in the visible spectrum. Uh, the air acts as a global blanket for the right amount of warmth that we need. Uh, there's, there's energy in our air when it comes from heat, the right amount of heat that we have, uh, nutrients for plants. Uh, the carbon dioxide also acts as a buffering agent in our oceans as it slightly acidifies it. And then uh, there's a certain amount of weight in our air and it's all finely tuned for life. And so whatever uh, uh, abiotic or prebiotic scenario for Earth's atmosphere, all of what they come up with has to switch over to this, to what we have now. And that's a huge challenge. And they're not even solving these problems. They're just saying, well, we think it's this. And then, and then um, they're not even addressing the issue, but switching. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started with uh, a little bit more into the paper, uh, the abstract, and, and the author is Melissa Trainer, and uh, she has been doing some research into this area. Rob, um, James, did you, do, did you uh, see anything about Melissa here that might help us understand uh, her background a little bit? Yeah, if I recall, I think she's a scientist at NASA. So they're looking at um, different possible origins of the chemicals for life, um, not just in these so-called uh, primordial soups or warm little ponds, as Darwin described them, but what could you even get to form in the air? Um, especially uh, some of the, uh, like the, the moon of, um, of uh, Saturn uh, Titan, you know, it, there's a hazy atmosphere and they were, uh, NASA scientists were able to send some space probes over there with some sophisticated equipment and they could identify uh, a couple of unique uh, molecules in the atmosphere and they were they're modeling that as what could possibly be happening on earth since we can't go back in time and earth is very different today the atmosphere is completely different way more oxygen because of photosynthesis um so what what are the possibilities what is um sunlight and ultraviolet radiation and cosmic rays able to do with um, the gases in the atmosphere um, one of the problems is we just don't know which gases are definitely or were definitely present in the early earth um, because in this scenario you know multiple billions of years ago is a very long time to try to guess uh, what happened but they can make there are some clues about you know based on the oxidation state of the minerals in the soil and and what's possible what's not possible um, chemically um, and, and it's changed over time, even since, you know, the 1953 Miller-Urey experiments yeah. where they, they proposed the ammonia and methane and water, um, uh, you know, the very simple gases. Um, some of, some of the, um, the ingredients for life, that, that formula has changed over time based on uh, new evidence. So we're going to take a look at some of that evidence, what's possible and what's uh, un in, unlikely. Right, and this author uh, looks like she's been studying 
uh, the atmosphere of other planets. And I think, you know, her opinion is worth something in terms of trying to understand that as you will, as we will see, we're not here to just credit uh, other scientists in their work. We're just trying to see how that the information plays here. So I, there's some good information that we want uh, to look at. So like James mentioned that uh, I think some of her background is um, into these, uh, th this haze around Titan that may have been here on earth and how that could be a source for, for a lot of organic molecules. So, so this is sort of a review and we're not gonna go into a lot of the details. We just wanna skim over some key points that she brings out uh, that help address this issue. And she basically says as a quick summary, we don't know, we don't know. So if someone says, hey, this is what the atmospheric composition was at, on, uh, before life and they're definitive, they're wrong because we, we really don't have strong evidence one way or another. Now, scientists are kind of converging on a set of chemicals, but uh, the, we don't know. There's not direct evidence. So for someone to say, I think there's ammonia there, uh, you know, that's uh, that's that's not a lot. It's not backed up by science. And, the, and there's really a lot of uncertainty there. Uh, there her suggestion and, and a number of scientists are saying it's likely just nitrogen and carbon dioxide. And that's very, that's, uh, very different from our early, uh, from our atmosphere, especially since there's no oxygen, no oxygen. And there needs to be the right mix of everything in our atmosphere in order to have enough, uh, uh, not for it to be too cold and not for it to be too hot. It's, we're in a Goldilocks zone and it's Goldilocks not only in distance from the sun, but in the chemical makeup. And she thinks that the, uh, maybe the, the organic hazes might be something that's there. So uh, a lot of it, Ryan, really quick, uh, sure. what we, you know, there's evidence uh, or they, they would claim geologic evidence that there wasn't oxygen, but why is that also important for chemistry? Like um, we should maybe talk about what would happen if Miller and Urey included oxygen in their flask along with uh, methane, hydrogen gas, and a spark. Yeah, uh, it's an experiment that I like to do in front of my class and in front of uh, audiences because oxygen and those flammable gases are a big hit. Um, I just did it for some elementary schools and they loved when I put oxygen in there and some sparks because it made a nice explosion for them. So yeah, yeah oxidation can be very damaging to these molecules. You get lots of different uh, um, harmful molecules, uh, yeah. but we also, uh, obviously need it for life today because uh, the most important molecules of life do have oxygen atoms in them. Yeah. Oxygen's very destructive. Super. And that's, and that's why the Miller Ray experiment doesn't work when there's oxygen as, as James was alluding to. So, uh, so this was just a, like a review paper. So I'm going to kind of quickly go through some points here. Uh, we know with the atmosphere is critical. And what's interesting because in the Miller Ray, they said, oh, there's methane and there was ammonia and, and hydrogen. And that's, that's not the scientific consensus now. The hydrogen can leave, that can escape. Um, these chemicals are too volatile. Methane does not last that long in the air and neither does ammonia. And, she, and this author brings these out. And so she's dismantling this, the gases that were used in the Miller rate experiment. And then she outlines some of the experiments and, and things that, uh, uh, that prove that you know having methane and ammonia, which were absolutely critical components for for many many papers in abiogenesis, um, those are very unfeasible uh, components in the, in the atmosphere. And uh, so I found that very interesting that she kind of bring the, uh, brings that out. Uh, so it, it's poorly understood if there was even if there was ammonia and carbon dioxide, these things there's too many ways for ammonia to break down. It just does not last long in the atmosphere and how it gets incorporated into the, into the water and into the grounds and, and uh, into the ground. So there's just, uh, the paper is speaking for the destruction uh, and the dismantling of a lot of the Miller Ray experiments. And the other thing they bring out is how toxic from a UV radiation perspective, the light that life or the sun and earth were, you know, kind of partnering with that there was probably many times greater greater UV. How, what does UV do to molecules, UV light, James? It's a catch-22 because uh, some of the abiogenesis papers um, use ultraviolet light as an energy source in order to create molecules. 
but those sometimes those very same molecules and certainly many other molecules are destroyed by ultraviolet light. I mean, we're all familiar with uh, just what ultraviolet, you know, sunlight can do to um, fade your uh, your your car's interior to cause skin cancer. You know, even truck drivers with their windows up, which the ultraviolet ultraviolet is mostly blocked by glass. Um, but if you look at their face over time and their left arm, yeah. at least if they're driving in places where they they drive on the left side of the truck, their arm is more aged looking and their left side of their face is more wrinkly and more moles and freckles than the right side. Uh, ultraviolet yeah. is one of those blessings and curses, just like water. Water is yeah. essential for life and it also destroys the molecules of life. Absolutely. And, and so there's, there's this, uh, it's, it's a big challenge to try to figure out this prebiotic uh, arrangement between the UV light that's coming from the sun. And it's not just UV light, there's gamma rays and x-rays and our, and our atmosphere blocks a lot of that. And so how do you, you got to account for all of these issues and ammonia is definitely not a good source for, for doing that. Uh, carbon dioxide and nitrogen, dinitrogen are, are good. That's what our atmosphere is, is uh, well, nitrogen is mainly made of. U UV is just dangerous. It destroys organic molecules, as James says. And if you have it under just the right you, uh, conditions, you can actually make some molecules like vitamin D, And uh, but too much is going to destroy. So you're constantly having to deal with this destruction ability uh, if you get too much UV. Now, this author was a big proponent of, hey, uh, life could have generated in a droplet uh, from the, these organic hazes, the, the little droplets in the air. And that's very different from a lot of other abiogenesis researchers are, are talking about. And she's, oh, this is the way to overcome the hydrolysis because she highlights that hydrolysis, once those chemicals are made, once they drop into the oceans, it's over for hydrolysis. W what do you know about hydrolysis, James? The, what the word means is hydro, meaning water, and lysis, which means to split or break. So it's a very common chemical reaction in which water is used to break larger molecules into smaller molecules. Well, in the origin of life, you need to take smaller molecules and build them up into larger ones. You need to create polymers, things like DNA and RNA and proteins. And, you know, all, all these polymers are subject to hydrolysis, not just the big molecules, but even the small molecules can get modified. You have a double bond between carbons, uh, it can get uh, hydrolyzed and, uh, and, and then oxygen will attach to it. Uh, you, you'll, you'll create an alcohol that way. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so it's a, it, it can be a very destructive uh, process, but also a crucial one to um, biochemistry as well. Yeah, which is why a lot of abiogenesis researchers are saying, well, it occurred on the, on the beaches, you know, on the, on the sands, you can get the, the tidal effect and the wet, wet dry cycles, but water's bad. It's not the friend that everybody thinks it is. Same with oxygen. Uh, one of the other issues that uh, she brings up that I'm kind of a, a big, big proponent of uh, recognizing that uh, nitrogen, you can have all the N2 you want in the air, but it is hard to make it usable. And so fixed nitrogen, we have uh, plants and little creatures that fix nitrogen for us now that help make sure there's plenty of usable nitrogen in the soil. Well, how did that happen before, before there was life? And uh, there's comments about maybe uh, lightning was able to, uh, and lightning does provide some usable nitrogen, but it's such a limited ingredient and it's so important for the amino acids from DNA and the nucleobases. You gotta have lots of nitrogen around and it's such a limiting factor. And she was once again, highlighting this in the paper that it's hard to get usable nitrogen. You maybe use hydrocyanic acid, um, Boy, hydrocyanic acid, that, is that something we can drink or, or what, what do you suggest? Well, if you want cyanide poisoning, which oh. will kill you very quickly, you know, it's been used in uh, major wars as a, a chemical uh, warfare agent. So yes, you know, there's always this catch 22. You need these poisonous molecules to supposedly create some of the smaller, simpler things like sugars and, and amino acids. Um, but then where do they, where do they go when the, the cell is going to be killed by them? <laughs> How yeah. does the cell deal with these, these uh, chemical warfare agents that are present in the, the primordial soup or in the, uh, in the atmosphere? Yeah. You would not want to breathe that stuff. No, and we're not, we're not, you know, and we're not suggesting that, um, you know, uh, 
we understand there's there, they were probably there initially and then somehow they magically went away maybe when uh, oxygen showed up on the scene um, you know according to this uh, evolutionary model another point that was brought up here was um, methane methane there's not enough methane you got to have this flux this incoming nature of uh, methane but how do you keep creating it you can't just have it in the atmosphere because it's going to go away and uh, it has a short relatively short half-life that may be on the order of decades but it eventually goes away not it doesn't last millions of years and methane is one of these key ingredients but she shot down methane and uh, because there's no way that's currently known to to make a method uh, to make methane which is called methanogenesis um, and so she really I thought uh, hydrocyanic acid was a key ingredient but it's, it's super reactive and very dangerous um, I had a note there that uh, HCN was a little bit better than ammonia. And if ammonia is around, it, it inhibits a lot of the reactions that abiogenesis researchers are using to make these abiotic molecules. And so there's this real conflict between what's in the atmosphere. They just think, oh, I'll just take what I need from the atmosphere. And then we're going to make our molecules here, not re uh, realizing how they interfere with each other. And yeah. ammonia is a base and it can um, mess up with the... Uh the pH chemistry, uh, it'll absorb uh, protons, um, you know, even, and of course, once you have a living cell, a buildup of ammonia is toxic. That's why we have to get rid of it by combining it with carbon dioxide to make urea and urinate it out of our, our, our bodies. You know, cells have to deal with ammonia because it's a, it builds up to toxic levels and alters the, the pH. Um, and then the methane, well, uh, the problem with accumulating methane in the air not only, I mean, it, it has some pros and cons. It, it is a greenhouse gas, so it can help warm up the earth enough to keep the water liquid. But um, you see a term in there called photolysis. We talked about hydrolysis or hydrolysis. Yeah. Uh, what do you guys think photolysis is? <laughs> uh, using light to break up things. That's right. So methane and, and ammonia, some of these other molecules, even in their simplest form, get uh, altered and damaged and converted uh, into, um, other products just by the energy of light. Yeah. So she just brings up another number of problems with ammonia and methane that are there. And, uh, but she's, she's really helping to define what, what, what could have been available, but it's starting to limit these origin of life researchers into the ingredients that they can use. And, and, and that's scientifically feasible. You can't, you have a lot of hydrogen around hydrogen will go in and react and fill up a lot of sites. On a, on a growing organic molecule. So there's limits to the amount of hydrogen around. And you don't want a lot of hydrogen anyway as the oxygen shows up. But hydrogen actually leaves our planet. We don't have enough gravity like Jupiter to hang on to it. So how do you keep it? So there's a real issue uh, with a number of gas molecules just based on their, on their density, uh, their reactivity, and she was bringing a number of these up. Uh, not to just, we, we don't want, we're gonna kind of quickly, you know, maybe start to wrap up this particular paper. Uh, that uh, there's just lots of limits that she was placing on, on having ammonia and methane and hydrogen um, and, how, and what these things do, and carbon dioxide, and what they do to the pH of the oceans, making them more acidic. The acidic nature of CO2 uh, would inhibit. It was another inhibitor of the structure uh, synthesis, which a lot of um, abiogenesis researchers are using. So you, you can't have it both ways. You can't have the atmosphere you want because it may destroy your synthesis. There needs to be this harmony between the atmosphere and what abiogenesis researchers are using. And uh, that's, uh, that's taking a while for that to happen. Um, so there's a lot of issues there. And she went on to talk about uh, how, the whole issues with sulfur chemistry. Sulfur is very important for a lot of our amino acids and the, and the disulfide bonds within uh, proteins and how uh, you got to get the oxidation state right of the atmosphere, this bond, uh, balance between reducing and uh, oxidation. So I would just want to kind of kind of get near the end of this paper where she talked about, uh, well, you know, maybe there's a lot of different atmospheres that could work, but there's a lot more considerations. They didn't, a lot of people haven't considered all the different gases yet um, and their influences on making things better or worse. And I would say that one of the important things that has not been resolved, and this is making it the probably one of those critical issues is the faint sun paradox. The sun that long ago uh, was not putting out the heat and the light. And 
how can you, your atmosphere has to compensate for that. And what does it have to be? Um, this is a, a fun graph to show the actual temperature of the earth is where we're at now. And if you go back four or 5 billion years ago, there's just, there wasn't a lot of light. And so the sun uh, would not have produced enough heat and light uh, to warm the earth. And so everything would have been frozen and you're stuck at that point. Uh, you're just a frozen snowball. And so uh, our, the gases in our air are critical for maintaining life and getting the right uh, heat light balance. And uh, this bottom green line or whatever this color is down here uh, shows the how cold it would be if we didn't have the right gases on there. And I think we just have to look to the news to see how finely tuned our air is right now with carbon dioxide, methane, uh, nitrogen dioxide, and all these other uh, components that are in the air. We have such a finely tuned mixture. Could there have been a finely tuned mixture before? Yeah, but nobody really seems to know what that is right now. And um, that's a huge challenge. And that atmosphere, if, some, if there's some agreement, which it's coming to, may not be supportive of the abiogenic molecules that are needed. So... This is a this is a real big challenge. James, any comments? Last comments here on this paper and on the or maybe on this paradox. Yeah, um, I guess another paradox is just how do you get enough of the the greenhouse gases to offset the cooler or fainter sun um, back then without having such high levels that you also block some of the uh, light needed to catalyze some of the reactions in the air. Or if you've got enough of the gases like carbon dioxide in the air and ammonia in the air, you know these things uh, will readily um, dissolve in the oceans and, and the you know, lakes and pools around the Earth. You know the carbon dioxide combines with H2O, CO2 and H2O form H2CO3, which is carbonic acid, um, and that's what makes uh, you know sodas taste so sour. It's that carbonic acid you're, mm -hmm. you're tasting. We have CO2 dissolved in our blood right now um, that keeps it a certain pH. And when we breathe out the CO2, that breaks up the acid and then the, the pH can go up a little bit, but it has to be kept very, very, very finely tuned. You know, in, in living cells today, uh, pH needs to be 7.4, but no more acidic than 7.35 and no more alkaline than 7.45. So we're talking about a very narrow uh, range for, for life. Uh, same with ammonia, it'll dissolve in water, pull up, uh, uh, pull a proton off of it and form ammonium ion. Um, so you're, you're adding a base to the water, um, and all, all of this stuff is in flux, you know, constantly going from the air into the, into the oceans and back. And so there, there's so much unknown about the, uh, the early atmospheric uh, concentrations. And you see some of the experiments they do, they're, they're trying to get a product, enough of a product to detect. So they will, they will tweak the gases so they're, you know, maybe 90 times higher than what would be even possible in, in an open atmosphere. Um, just to try to get some of these uh, chemical reactions to work. So they're, they're not necessarily modeling uh, what what is available, um, uh, even concentration-wise in the early Earth, um, in order to try to get the chemistry to work, in, in order to try to drive the reactions in a particular direction so you don't break apart your molecule faster than you form it. So a lot of uh, little behind-the-scenes uh, tricks going on there that I think most people have no idea about. Absolutely. So, I mean, here's a paper. It was from 2013. We're going to do a one that was from a few months ago uh, next. We'll try to go maybe a bit quicker through that one. But th there's not a consensus here. There, This is a debate. Yeah. And, and uh, I think a lot of people are going to think, well, they're going to work it out. They're going to work it out. OK, but we there there is much work to be done yet. And so it's almost how can you start all these abiotic uh, studies when you don't even know the atmosphere yet? Cause you're going to have to go back and start over. And so I, I find that to be a big challenge. There's just a lot of requirements for the gases in our air. And it, it, if your requirement is what I need to make uh, uh, some molecules, then that's not the, you, there's so many things you got to think about that we went through. It's toxicity, it's flammability, it's a greenhouse uh, effect, uh, how it deals with light and letting in the different uh, wavelengths and, um, things with density and reactivity. So, I mean, there's a long list that a lot of people uh, overlook. Many paradoxes yet to resolve. This is not a done deal in the scientific community. And I think that's important to know. Uh, okay, any last thoughts, James? Because I think we should jump over to our next paper here. Yeah, let's uh, move on here. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay, next paper. Uh, this one is, this was from last November. So, man, this is uh, practically hot off the press. Um, these uh, scientists were looking at nucleoside synthesis. So these actually, these papers are connected as you will see here in just a moment. Uh, uh, how they may have come up with a simple yet selective way to make uh, the proper nucleosides. James, could you just remind us real quick, what's a nucleoside? What, what are they making here? Yeah, so uh, I, I have um, some diagrams on my presentation, but I think we'll do that. We'll save that for part two, where we can yeah. dive into the components yeah. of nucleic acids and yeah, exactly. stability. Yeah. But just for terminology for now, um, you have you have a nucleobase. Uh, the base is just uh, it's a, a ring structure with carbons and nitrogens, and you probably heard of them as at least the abbreviations A, T, G, C, and U: adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, uracil. Um, you know, you, you find uracil in RNA, you find thymine in DNA, and that's just that's just the base. And then when the base is attached to a sugar, we call it a nucleoside, uh, S for, for the sugar. So ah, in RNA, yeah. that sugar is yeah. ribose. And in DNA, it's the same sugar, but one of the oxygens has been removed off of carbon number two, so we call it deoxyribose. So that's your Perfect. nucleoside. Then you also need at least one phosphate. Uh, once there's a phosphate on there, then we call that nucleotide. Um, so if it has one phosphate, it's a nucleotide monophosphate. Two phosphates is diphosphate, three phosphates, triphosphates. Perfect. So, so you've probably heard of ATP. That's adenosine triphosphate. It's a very important molecule. It's a component of DNA, RNA. Uh, it's our energy currency of the cell. It powers you know thousands of different reactions in the cells. Um, that's an exam example of a nucleotide. Now, if you link those together, you form a nucleic acid, and that's what your 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 strands of uh, DNA or RNA yeah. are. So, a little bit of confusion in the terminology there. We'll we'll yeah. cover that next time. Very good. So this this uh, this is actually another review paper where they're looking at what a number of researchers have done. We're going to try not to go into an uh, incredible amount of detail uh, here. It just, you know, they're they're trying to review, you know, what's the latest. So this is, and this is just a few months ago. What's the latest in making RNA and DNA and making the the, the nucleobases and the nucleosides? So it's sort of that metal version of that. And uh, what I liked about this paper was, uh, well, first of all, I've got to put it in context. Have they solved how to make life? No, the, we're still way down here on step one, way down here. Okay, now we've gone up from nothing, from like the floor up to step one, where this is doing. So we are still miles away from life, and that and this is the latest research. You know, some of the late in summary of the latest research that's here. So um, he, I, what I liked about what this guy was doing here, uh, Professor Trapp, was thinking about okay, we you got, we got to we got to be more definitive and what how we design our experiments so they're plausible. And, uh, and he goes on in this paper to actually destroy a bunch of other people's research because they were not using plausible conditions. And so he tries to lay them out and he lays out the fact, which is then a summary of what we just read from this paper uh, eight years earlier, uh, seven years from, from this paper here, that yeah, we gotta have nitrogen, gotta have water, gotta have CO2. Ameliorate out the tube here because no ammonia, no, no methane. And so those were the, some of the key gases in the Miller Urey experiment. So uh, he said, that, yeah, I mean, there's been enough studies that we, the Miller Urey experiment is off the table, at least the way that's run. And there's certainly modern versions of it um, that are producing, people produce simple ingredients. So he says, all right, here's some plausible prebiotic conditions. You should do it in water. Okay, with there, but there's even issues with water, but at least water was around, that would make sense. Simple starting materials gained from high energy gas phase reactions. All right, if you're gonna use an ingredient, probably had to come from some gases with lightning had passed through. Um, you can't really change these initial conditions too, uh, too much. So if you're gonna modify them, it can't be too serious. Uh, no sequential additions of reagents. We're gonna come back to this point right here. Uh, that just means, okay, I'm gonna add this and then I'm gonna add this guy and then this other chemical and this other chemical he is saying, if you see a paper where they're talking about this step, and then they took that uh, molecule and then ran another reaction, and then took the outcome of that one and ran it with another reaction, you're not doing plausible prebiotic chemistry. If there's steps in it, 
you're not doing pre plausible prebiotic. It has to be one pot, and which means you got to throw it all together there. And you got to keep the temperatures moderate. And it's okay if you have some metal salts and a porous service or, or catalyst. But even that's missing a lot of things in my mind. I don't think he's modifying the atmosphere like he should. You're not, you're not laying out some good plaza. I mean, he's saying it there, but he's not saying you need to evacuate your chamber. Uh, we got to throw some UV light in there and you have to do it inside the chamber because the glass is going to block a lot of the UV light. And what about all the other chemical reactions that were probably around? There needs someone. He's, hey, maybe there's a business here. We, we will sell you a uh, prebiotic mixture that you should start all your chemical reactions with. And we could go into business here. We'll also say, hey, this is a prebiotic mixture. Go start your reactions uh, with that. See if you can come up. He doesn't address pH um, uh, and some other things. But uh, any comments from the prebiotic conditions there, James, that might have come up? I think that I think you covered them all that I can think of right now. Yeah. And he, he, he goes through and starts to talk about stability of molecules, which is something that's really big um, that you're you're writing and, and, and talk about, James, is just how, how about, you know, how stable are molecules? Just because you make it doesn't mean anything. He, so he's destroying someone else's research here. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about stability in just a second. Uh, where one of the key ingredients in making one of these nucleosides, this was this guy commenting on another person's synthesis. He says, uh, this is probably not prebiotically plausible because this compound number four uh, decomposes uh, with a half-life of three hours at a pH 10, which was the conditions to run the reaction. So he's destroying he's destroying the chemistry and I didn't have to do the work. I just had to read it and copy it there. And so a lot of uh, prebiotic chemistry has been destroyed by itself. These guys are shooting at each other going, your chemistry doesn't make sense and your chemistry doesn't make sense either. And uh and so uh, this, this point of stability, um, I think, is way overlooked. They just, we made it. We made it. We're done. Um, in a lot of these papers, it's almost like they, they're, they're running over to the machine to detect it before it yeah. reacts or disappears. And like, hey, it's possible to make it. And you're like, OK, we're going to go ahead and leave that out of the next step because we don't want it to get destroyed in the subsequent reactions. Um, but we show it as possible. So as long as you can get to that safety net, you know, just that little next step up, then you can say it's possible. But you leave that same molecule in the reaction a little bit longer, uh, especially uh, when you start um, adding additional uh, types of reactions. Ah, uh, you, you lost your precious molecule or yeah. got uh, adulterated beyond anything useful for life. <laughs> yeah. And so this is something I, uh, I'm, I'm starting to look forward. Hey, tell me about the stability of your molecule. How long is it lasting? Your ingredients. And I think it's overlooked. And a number, he was destroying another one where he said, well, uh, this other ingredient, number seven in the paper, whatever that was, he said, um, it's, we haven't encountered it in prebiotic chemistry, so we haven't resolved it. But maybe it was delivered by some kind of comet or asteroid. Uh, you know, because it's important for prebiotic chemists here to look at locally sourced uh, molecules. And I'm not sure what the definition is in some of these papers. It may be locally within the galaxy. I don't know, as long as you get a comet or something coming. So they're often appealing to some kind of out of the world delivery system, which I understand could, could be plausible. Maybe there's some meteorite or comet that delivered things. But uh, I, I just think that's a challenging uh, source for a lot of your uh, materials. Uh, so he just talks about all these dead ends throughout the papers. This, he's, so he's critiquing and shooting down a lot of the other ones. Why would he do that? Why would he do that? Because he's going to come in with a one pot to solve and save the day here, solve the solution. So, um, But he, he's the one that reiterates here in the paper that we would need to bring out again. A sequential addition of reagents in the described order is essential to guarantee the successful outcome. This is what a lot of researchers need. In nature, however, such a scenario is unlikely, bearing the problem of sequential addition in mind. Um, ba basically, nature doesn't have that ability. He's recognizing that ability to do sequences. So if you're putting things in a certain sequence, that's unnatural because nature can't work that way. You can't select and point out and pull out what it needs and put it in there. It has to be in one pot. So he's laying it out. I think he's absolutely right. And uh, they, they try to solve these problems that maybe some of the bad things crystallize and crystallize out. And one of the things you want uh, is, is awesome. So I think we, we've got to recognize if, uh, with this abiotic chemistry, if there's sequential addition, 
um, you're, you're not doing it. You're not doing it. You're not doing plausible uh, prebiotic chemistry. So uh, we, you got to throw it into one pot and hope for the best. Um, so he comes in at the end with his one pot synthesis and uh, he does it. He takes, he goes from a nucleobase, which I'm not sure where he got that from, probably Sigma Aldrich or someplace. And uh, which, which was, cause they're, they're, they're a pretty good chemical company. I think they were there uh, a few billion years ago. That's why they do so good. Uh, no, I joke. Uh, but uh, he's able in one pot to go from the nucleoside to the, he says, highly stereo and selective pathway towards a deoxyribonucleoside. That's really cool. And that's pretty impressive. And that's kind of why I think he was writing this paper was to kind of highlight his own work. They did this one pot synthesis. But that's such a small step in the whole, in the whole abiogenesis world. Uh, but good for him. Good for him. And then he goes on to like destroy his own work and say, well, we, we did it with these three chemical reagents here, but um, uh, we have to rule these out because they didn't polymerize and make these polymers that that life is based on. And uh, he highlights how in, the, the ingenuity of nature is far beyond humans' expectations. And we need to find some simple ways that nature has worked out and see if we can uh, back out from there that uh, some, may, some maybe uh, ancient relic of a way uh, that it was being done abiotically and biologists picked up, the biology just picked up that way. So I, I think he's kind of shot in everybody down, including himself. I didn't really have to do it for him. Um, so there's just lots of holes left, lots of holes in abiotic chemistry. This has not worked out at all. And, uh, and even if some of this is, they've made some amino acids, you made some nucleobases, you're, you're still miles and miles, hundreds of miles away from life. And uh, with all the thousands of uh, chemicals that you need there, so he, he, he dismantled everybody. We didn't have to do it. So, you know, I know there's a battle between, uh, you know, intelligent design and, uh, and abiotic uh, chemistry here and evolution. But I, mean, I feel like they just shot themselves. <laughs> there was some uh, friendly fire there taking themselves down. So if you're, if you're looking for some uh, ways to improve abiogenesis or to, to knock them down, that paper was pretty good. Um, so I think just to kind of summarize that paper and we'll take some questions. Um, all these nucleobases, nucleosides, nucleotides, they're not jumping out of these reactions. They're, they're, they're finding them in low yield. If they do find them under uh, very tightly controlled uh, reactions, you'd say, well, this guy did it in one pot. Yeah, but he started off with, you know, a, a clean uh, reagent and then in one pot, yeah, he, he made the, the nucleobase into the nucleoside. And so, I, I, you know, I just find it amazing that if, if if life was so easy, we should be seeing some more evidence of these chemicals sort of coming together and making making uh, nucleic acids, these DNA and RNA polymers. I, th I think it's kind of highlighting how hard it is to do that. What do you think, James? Uh, absolutely, this reminds me of uh, the review paper we were looking at um, from like a year or two ago where they summarized the different types of chemistry, uh, chemical reactions that could um, form some of the key molecules of life, not, not the the long chains, not like uh, RNA or DNA or proteins, but just, you know, the basis of the uh, nucleic acids or the amino acids that make up proteins. And we were laughing to ourselves at some of the, the reaction conditions and how different they are. Like in one case, you need something that's got like, you know, eight molar uh, uh, concentration of some something, which you would never find something that concentrated right. just naturally. Right. We found uh, 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 what was it? Hydrazine, you know, rocket fuel as one of the ingredients. We, we found uh, uh, all sorts of molecules that there's just no no way these are going to be uh, present on an early earth, especially not at the concentration needed to um, trigger the reactions. And we have to remember in these papers, when they're showing you a finished product, they say, aha, we got, uh, a, you know, adenine or, or we got to adenine bound to a, a sugar. But they're not showing you is all of the other molecules Right, that, I can uh, also formed, yeah. that, that uh, compete with these molecules, that compete for resources, that tangle everything up. And so I think that's uh, probably a good uh, uh, target for our next discussion is, is to talk about this uh, messy chemistry that goes on. And, and, yeah. and you know, when uh, the Miller-Urey experiments were reanalyzed you know, years later when we had better equipment, scientists went back and scraped out some of that, that gunk, that black and brown, uh, really sticky substance that was left in the flask that was so hard to remove that 
you, you just throw the glassware away at that point. You don't even try to clean it because it's stuck on there so much. And they say, oh, I wonder what's in here. And they, they find, you know, thousands of, of, of other chemicals that have nothing to do with life. They're in a hopeless, tangled mess. And um, just the sheer number of possible molecules you can get with, with carbon and how few of those are ac actually used by um, by life. Um, I have a, a sort of a, a segue. I, I know we're at an hour, so I don't want to talk about this too long. But this is a really simple molecule. It's just five carbons completely surrounded by hydrogens. It's called pentane. It's all single bonds. Something that you know might be produced in the atmosphere of Titan or on early Earth. And you're like, hey, that's exciting. You were able to put something together. Not only did you have, you know, if I just took off one of these and put a hydrogen on here, that's, that would be CH4 or methane. And I link them together and I can get a hydrocarbon, um, pentane. It's a, it's a gas at, at room temperature. But this is just one of the possible ways that I can arrange these bonds. Um, th this is uh, when we can rearrange bonds without adding or removing any of the atoms, any of the carbons or hydrogens, uh, hydrogen uh, atoms, we, we call those isomers. So let's see what other ways I can rearrange this so that I'm not changing the mass, I'm not changing the composition. It's gonna have the same number of carbons and hydrogens, but uh, just arranged differently. So what if I take one off on the end here and you know I could stick it on the other end, but that would still be the same molecule just flipped upside down. But what if I took um, hydrogen off of the second carbon here? Oops. I can get what we call a methyl group, this methane with just the, the three hydrogens called a methyl group. I'm gonna put that on the second carbon. Now I have a different molecule, has a different name, different melting point, different boiling point, and I haven't changed the number of carbons or hydrogens in this molecule. We even give it a different name. Um, I could also take the other one on the end here, stick it in the, that same carbon. And now I've got a third isomer of, of pentane. Completely different shape, different uh, properties. So that's just three different possible ways of arranging the carbons in a five carbon molecule. Well, it gets exponentially higher the more carbons you have. If I took eight, uh, octane, you can probably guess how many carbons that has. You're like, where have I heard of octane? Oh yeah, there's a lot of it in gasoline. I get high octane gasoline. Uh, so eight carbons in there. Well, there's 18 different possible isomers that you can form with eight carbons. You get to, uh, you know, like a 50 carbon long chain. I mean, you have earwax that has that many carbons in it. <laughs> and uh, Maybe you do. No. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll leave a little bit there because it helps keep the bugs from crawling in your ears at night. Absolutely. And, and it's not <laughs> no. I'll clean it all I, out. I clean it every day. It's, I, so it's, how many it's isomers? Oh, oh, we're talking like millions and millions of isomers, like a, a hundred carbon molecule, trillions of possible. And that's just with carbon and hydrogen. I imagine how many more there are if you threw in like a nitrogen or a phosphorus or yeah. an oxygen or, or add double bonds or triple bonds. So um, the, the type of random chemistry you get with, uh, you know, whether you're talking about in the atmosphere or primordial soup, um, there's orders and orders of magnitude more of these useless or harmful or detrimental or interfering molecules mixed in that soup compared to the, the one lovely molecule that they show you in the paper yeah. that they claim, we have victory, we have success, look, we got what we were looking for. It's like, all right, that's just a, a one needle in a stack of haystacks and the needles are quickly rusting away. <laughs> right. So I think that's uh, what we, you know, we're ready for some questions. And, you know, I, I guess our, my final comment is, uh, is there a biogenesis success? No, no, we're, they're just, they're making some molecules, making some ingredients and we'll give them that. They've made some, are they abiotically uh, plausible? Eh, not too many of them. <laughs> um, so, we're ready for some questions. If uh, if you if we if we've got some, I don't know. Maybe we put some people to sleep. I'm sure <laughs> they heard chemistry and they said, "Oh, that's <laughs> no, no. yeah." No, that was great. That was. Great. 
I'm definitely uh, re-watching this one probably tonight. That was awesome, gentlemen. Uh, we've had a lively chat, tons of good questions. Um, and what I'm going to do too is, is we'll get through a few of them. But uh, since we don't want to go too much over an hour, I'll save them all because we're doing uh, multiple shows on, on this. So, yeah. you know, I'll have a separate document where we make sure we get to all the questions eventually. I, I will say this before we go to the question. I really like the way you noted on the, the second paper. You put, uh, this paper helps dismantle the other prebiotic origin of scenarios. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they're doing it for us, right? Oh, and absolutely. <laughs> it, it, it reminds me of uh, many other papers. One that comes to mind, I can't remember the exact title, but it's something like, the RNA world, just as bad as all the other hypotheses. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it's the best we got. <laughs> yeah. Right. That, but, but it's the best we got. So, you know, what are we going to do? Anything but God, apparently. So yeah, exactly. um, let me get to a few of these questions. Uh, um, let me find a couple more recent ones that I can maybe pop up on the screen. But I've got many from an hour ago when, when we first started. So those all I saved in the side. Um, here we go. One from Brandon that maybe we can answer first and then I'll pull up some of the others that I got saved. This should be coming on the screen now. <laughs> I see the question. Ah, oh, man, I, I've, okay. been wondering, I've been wondering the same thing. Uh, I think this is what some groups are trying to figure out. I, mean, I think why is there more people trying to figure this out? Like, what's the what's the the least amount of uh, genes and structure and chemicals that you need for the modern cell? Um, you know, because there's, uh, from my estimates, there and I, this came up last time. Uh, you know, there's three to five thousand different chemicals in the simplest uh, organisms, and you know, and then then you got hundreds of genes. So. Um, let me read it really quick in case someone's listening or oh, driving. Yeah. And um, okay, it's good. Uh, this it's is from Brandon. It says skeptics like to say that a biogenesis doesn't require modern cells. A modern cell requires at least 493 genes for replication alone. Uh, so, what would be a plausible initial life form? Uh, yeah, this this there has been some experimentation done with like Craig Venter, and they just kind of dis disable, disarm, uh, mutate um, the simplest organisms that they can find like the simplest bacteria with the smallest genomes until they get to the point where like, oh, we've gone too far. Okay, I guess that's crucial. And then they try knocking out a couple others. Oh, I guess those were crucial because the cell died. Um, but there is a minimum threshold. Uh, you know, you can't just say, oh, all we need is five molecules. You know, it's it, there's it, it's going to be on the order of, of hundreds or even thousands, thousands. Of, uh, of molecules. Um, and even if you had all the parts, of course, you know, it, you can't claim victory if you, even if you could show that there's some sort of plausible naturalistic way to, to form every single molecule that we find in living cells today, because it's how they come together yep. and how they extract energy from their environment. And that's often overlooked. You know, you can kind of hand wave and say, oh, well, you know, if there's a, a hydrothermal vent, there's a temperature gradient there, or uh, even a, a pH gradient. Hey, we got a chemical gradient there. We have more um, pu plus charges on one side and more minus charges on the other side. This all has to be so carefully coordinated and controlled. Uh, it, it's like, you know, uh, take a corn chip and set fire to it. It'll have the same number of calories as whether you eat it, it ate that corn chip and digested it and harvested the energy that you got from breaking down that corn chip, but we do it very carefully or we'd spontaneously combust. And we have to be able to uh, utilize some of that energy to make other molecules like ATP. We got to break down the, the environmental molecules so that we can use the parts and the energy to create new molecules in a different arrangement. So there has to be this coupling of the reactions and that's going to take a, a, a large number of molecules that are very sophisticated to be able to to capture that and harness and utilize that energy. We have to create gradients. You do have to have some kind of compartmentalization. If you don't want to call it a modern cell, fine, you call it a protocell, but that's that membrane has to be able to separate, you know, things like uh, potassium and sodium, which, you know, the, the concentration, what we find in cells today is, is 40 times, 
higher concentration in the opposite direction than what you find naturally in the ocean because we have pumps that pump the sodium and potassium to where they're supposed to be and get them at the right concentration to make that cell function. So um, yeah, no, no uh, there, I don't think there's a, any way of knowing the minimum, um, but uh, we, we can be confident in saying it's gonna take in, in, the, in the thousands of molecules range um, to get the simplest cell to, to, to survive, replicate, repair itself, have a fairly high fidelity of replication because you know you introduce too many mistakes it's gonna you yeah. have error catastrophe in the information system um yeah it's it's one of those most uh, irreducible complex <laughs> components is the first living cell absolutely what's next okay well good thorough answer um, like I said earlier in the intro, I'm glad we're on the same side because <laughs> this has been great. Um, I've got a good one here from uh, Logical Plausible Probable. So I appreciate the super chat. I'm just going to read a word for word here. He says, stop, tRNA, stop tRNAs bind in with specific release protein in different spots than the others in the ribosome. Is this even addressed? by the origin of life researchers <laughs> they're not even there it, John, john's getting ahead of us so <laughs> yeah next, one of the next papers we're going to be talking about is this supposed uh, pre-trna or how do you get the the original translation mechanism before you have the sophistication of of ribosomes and um and the ribosomal rna and the, the trnas i mean there's there's a dozen there's more than a dozen different proteins involved in just prepping a trna molecule so that it can be ready for translation. Um, and like you pointed out, uh, there's three of those tRNAs that don't receive an amino acid. Their job is to stop the assembly line, to stop the synthesis of proteins. If you get a mutation in one of the stop codons, you know, you get your protein made and it starts folding and it, oh, it made a nice shape. Oh no, what's this huge tail we have growing out of us? And then all of a sudden that tail is gonna start interfering with the main part of the protein and you get uh, disease because of that. So there's several diseases caused by mutations in those stop codons. But uh, so we're probably like two or three lectures from now going to be talking about that. That's a, we'll, we'll come back to that question later. Awesome, awesome. I've got a question here. Um, let me see from came in right at the beginning. Actually, a couple questions that are the exact same, one from uh, John Maddox and one from Redefined Living. So uh, let's see, I'll combine them both into one. Uh, can you tell us about RNA on clay problems? This whole claim that supposedly they've created RNA on clay. James, you have any I, I think I, there's a few things I would say, but... Yeah, well, we talked about the hydrolysis problem, and one of the attempts to overcome that is to say, well, since there's there's going to be more water, and water is going to drive the reaction in reverse, it's going to cause big molecules to split into smaller ones. How are you going to form these longer chains like RNA? So one of the proposals is uh, an experimental um, uh, test is to use these mineral-rich clays like morulonite, and uh, uh, you know there, there's various clays that whoops arm went off, um, that help catalyze the reaction, speed up the reactions. Um, so the clay acts as a catalyst. Um, so it, the, um, the problem here is you have to also detach the molecule in order to get to replicate. And when it detaches, um, it is going to go back into the water and begin the process of hydrolysis again. The other thing is like all catalysts, and I'm gonna let Ryan talk about this because he's very familiar with using catalysts to create polymers. Uh, what are what are the problems with catalysts in, in general, like clays? Yeah, you know, number one, in order for uh, most catalysts and clays to be used as a catalyst, they have to be purified. They, they have to be activated. Uh, why? They are so easily deactivated. They're so easily poisoned is what it's called. Another molecule gets in there and just sticks, and it's over. It's over. I, I've uh, I've worked on with a lot of a lot of catalysts in my field. Uh, people are trying to make reusable catalysts with these dendrobar nanoparticles, 
and it is such a challenge. They're able to reuse them, not hundreds of times, not thousands, of times, like 10 times, 15 times. And they're like, oh, we're so happy we got to reuse it 10 times. Why? Because they poison so easily. And you're, it's over. It's over at that point. And you got to have someone, something reactivating it. Oh, maybe, you know, the sun comes up. But that reactivation is usually high temperatures and it would fry any organic molecule. And that's why you reactivate it in a nice high temperature oven. So RNA on, on, on clays, oh man, I, sure, it works in the lab. Um, but the RNA world has another problem of the RNA sticking with each other. And I, I didn't know that until one of someone else who was some other abiogenesis researcher was trying to shoot down the RNA world to go for this uh, chimeric DNA slash RNA world. And they were like, hey, look, the RNA world has a problem. Everything's sticky and they don't come apart. I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. Thanks for telling me. And uh, so the RNA world is being shot out now. That's that's old news. If you believe in the RNA world, you're, you're believing in uh, old ancient history books now. Also, the catalysts are not specific <laughs> or selective, so they are going to be speeding up right. reactions that you don't want uh, yeah. as well. Like, oh, you need that precious double bond to be in that in that molecule, but uh, now that it got close to the catalyst, it just accelerated the oxidation of the molecule or the uh, hydro yeah. hydrogenation of the molecule or hydrohalogenation of the molecule or any yeah. number of, of these uh, um, addition reactions that are going to you know, completely alter the molecule and make it useless for life. Yeah, that's why it's important to actually do chemistry because you realize a lot of these issues showed up. I actually worked for a company. We were trying to use catalysts and fuel cells. And boy, we were reforming uh, JP8, which was uh, like a jet fuel that the army was using. And boy, that would poison the catalyst, something fierce. And uh, and the, these fuel cells just went, more, that was something simple. Uh, forget about something more complicated like living system. So uh, yeah, catalyst RNA, a lot of problems there for the long-term you know, viability of, of that particular type of chemistry. Well, that was a really great response, gentlemen. Um, and really helpful because I've heard uh, it, almost every debate on abiogenesis that's brought up. So that's really helpful. <laughs> um, but we'll, 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 yeah, so that was really good. Um, we'll start winding it down with this one here. This one's a chat from Don again. Logical, plausible, probable. So I appreciate the support, brother. He says, I've been reviewing MIT undergrad biochem classes oh. and the depth of explanation for different concepts he feels is lacking. Do you guys experience the same thing, he, he asks? It's kind, of, it's kind of a necessity because the stuff we're understanding and we don't even have it all figured out is so complicated that it's hard for even one human mind to wrap around everything that's going on and even these um, simple pathways. So in the undergraduate level, they purposely leave out some of the more intricate details like they'll just say oh there's a complex here and it does this thing here's here's what it reacts with and here's what it's going to produce and it takes some energy what they don't tell you is that complex is made up of like 40 different parts and requires like a magnesium uh cofactor or uh you know a cytochrome or you know it's doing like you know quantum physics uh, tricks <laughs> to pass on electrons you know that all, all this stuff is it's just it would overwhelm the student and, you, and your class would end up being like 10 years long um, if you really wanted to go through all the details. So it's kind of a necessity. And sometimes it's just because that's as far as the professor learned in their book. You know, that, that they didn't go into the papers that went into all the steps. They just learned enough to be able to understand the fundamental concepts. And then so they, they've reached the limits of their knowledge and they're teaching what they know. And, and usually they're holding back quite a bit uh, for these poor students. Yeah, it would be uh, uh, you know freaked out if they saw how how chemically scary it really was. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know they're just trying to pass the MCAT. So I <laughs> I would say two things real right. quick on, on that topic. Um, that I, first, I would be wondering if it's an intro to biochemistry class or is it a legit senior level, um, you know, biochemistry class, uh, senior uh, college level. Uh, biochemistry, junior, senior level, 400. Uh, yeah, like James said, there's just so much. There's just too much. And uh, students are easily overwhelmed. 
Um, the other thing is the, the topic of abiogenesis in these biochemistry textbooks, they're cutting that out because there, there's just so much that they need to get to that's so important for, for medicine and for health and how our body operates that this, like having the, the discussion of abiogenesis, like where did it come from, is irrelevant for modern health. And so why are they wasting precious, precious, precious pages on uh, the stuff that's not even settled anywhere, in, you know, that very well in science? So um, if it was so settled, they, that should be making those bigger and bigger chapters. But it's going the other way in modern biochemistry textbooks. So, um, yeah, there, there's yeah, we're we're fearfully and wonderfully made. That's such an important point because you know, you've, you've heard it say, and I can't remember who said it now, uh, that nothing makes sense in biology except through the, you know, through evolution. And here you have these professors, even the ones who believe that we came about by natural processes and, right. and long millions of years of evolution. And they're like, you know what? I'm training people who are going to go into healthcare. I'm training people who are going to go into biotech. We don't think about evolution when we're doing this. And we don't utilize uh you know, even if you believed it, it, it doesn't help us solve the, the problems of medicine and uh, and chemistry and engineering and bi and uh, biology. It's, it's so you can teach evolution. You got to know it. <laughs> um, I agree. I agree 100 percent. In, in the practical level. <laughs> yeah. They always come up with the bacteria. Well, evolution is helps us to deal with antibiotics and things. OK. Yeah. Which um, is not uh, okay. new information. It's just breaking pre-existing information. Yeah. One thing. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, um, yeah, no, the, amen, amen. We are fearfully and, and wonderfully made. Uh, right here, I'm going to make this the last one, then we're going to shut it down for, for the day. This has been great. Hour and 15 minutes has flown by. So much great information, and we've still got roughly 40 people in the chat. Oh, everybody's enjoying it. You guys kept it fun. So last question then from Luca. I appreciate the question, Luca. And like I said, uh, gentlemen, I'm going to save all the other questions for future shows. So he says, what do you guys think about the great oxidation event? And in brackets, he puts a mass extinction caused by oxygen. I'm not, I've never personally heard of that, but. Oh, man. I actually gave a uh, talk on it. I gave a talk on it this weekend um, at church. <laughs> uh, a little bit. I. Uh, <laughs> I look at this quite a bit. I would have to have a whole show on that, honestly. Um, I'll summarize as best I can. Great oxidation event. So uh, basically, there was a point in this uh, abiotic, you know, Earth's history in the evolutionary model that says there's no oxygen. Why was there no oxygen? Well, because it ruins all the chemistry. But at some point, there was uh, these green sulfur bacteria that evolved. And then they eventually had the ability to do photosynthesis uh, magically. And that's then where oxygen came from. And then these little bacteria, uh, you know, burped out all of this oxygen and eventually it coated everything and oxidized everything. And then the oxygen level finally started to accumulate. And they call that the great oxidation event. And uh, so I'd like to say that I dismantled that this weekend. Uh, one of the most complicated um, uh, uh, systems is the photosynthetic reaction center. Uh, I know this personally because I I, re I I worked I actually ran um, uh, electron transfer reactions with with live photosystem two system um, extracts. I made molecules that dealt with uh, donor acceptor um, electron transfer reactions using light pulses. I understand what it takes to uh, to move electrons around and generate energy and to do things. That was my graduate work. And uh, for all of that to happen by random chance, even the simplest system uh, would not be very effective and any minor change to it deactivates it. And so uh, photosynthesis in the evolutionary model had to be one of the first things that, not the first thing, but fairly close to it, to evolve in order for oxygen to show up on the scene. And it is so intricate that uh, any little piece that's out of whack, um, the electron transfer reactions don't happen, the chemistry doesn't happen. And uh, so you can't you can't piecemeal photosynthesis. You you have to make these system, photosystem one has. Uh, I'm probably going to get it mixed up. They have hundreds of uh, parts that of the molecules. They have to be correctly spaced and orientated to each other, 
or, or photos, uh, photosynthesis doesn't happen. And all of those molecules are made by living systems. They do not naturally occur. They are, they, they can't just be gathered and put into place. And, um, and so photosynthesis is something I spent a, uh, quite a bit of time looking into, and that's the key thing behind the great oxidation event. I'll, I'll just add quickly that in addition to uh, producing oxygen, um, most of the clouds and the rainfall we get today is because of these marine organisms that make uh, sulfur gases like dimethyl sulfide that gets turned into dimethyl sulfoxide. And these add as cloud condensation nuclei. It's a molecule in the air that attracts water so you get a little bit of that water gas vapor to accumulate around it. And then it keeps piling on because the water attracts other water until it's you know large enough to form a raindrop and drop down. So we you know think of all the, the cycles in, in the earth, um, just getting that rain to rinse down minerals into, into lakes and into oceans and, and then carry it back again with the energy of the sun. And um, you know, it, it, it's like our whole world uh, had to, is interdependent on life. You know, the very planet itself was interdependent on, on the microbes and in the organisms to generate other useful molecules. And, you know, we're, we're interdependent on each other. We're interdependent on the bacteria that outnumber our own cells 10 to one to make us, uh, our vitamins. And, um, and, and it's just, it's a, you, you can't have these things come out in isolation because pretty, you know, Every single cell in the world is is dependent on other cells. Yeah, yeah. That's a great point. Well, there you go. It looks like we're going to end it with a bang, uh, Luke. In terms of questions, I guess. Uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. I, I I love your guys' passion and how informative you guys are on each question. So it's incredibly helpful. Like, like I said earlier, I'm definitely rewatching this one tonight. Um, yes. I want to thank you guys. And thank, uh, I want to thank the audience for, uh, being so lively and having so many good questions. Please share this around, um, share the entire series around as we do it, because this information is so important. We want to get it out to as many people as possible. So uh, thanks again, Dr. Hayes and Dr. Carter uh, for giving us your time. I really, really appreciate this. Um, any thoughts, uh, gentlemen, before we shut it down for the day? Go ahead, James. I just want to add that uh, Sal is having an after show. Um, he's put the link there in the comments section. Mm. Um, I'll, I'll be listening in. Maybe I can uh, participate, but I do have to take my in-laws to get their second dose of the, the vaccine. So I don't know if I'll be able to, uh, participate live, but we'll see. Yeah. I just, uh, thank you for having me on again. I look forward to the other discussions and, um, uh, and, uh, and working with James, I like, and with all you guys here and I appreciate what, uh, the other, uh, people in the, in the comment section and, and things have said. So just thank you. And, um, it's fun looking at this chemistry. I wish I had more time, but I've got to go teach some students, uh, get some homework graded. And, um, so back, back to life, back to reality. Look forward to our next talk. Right. Ryan. Hey, who needs, who needs sleep? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I appreciate you guys are incredibly busy and, and you were generous. Uh, with your time tonight. So God bless you. God bless the audience and everybody have a good day and head on over to uh, Sal's channel for an after show. Uh, God bless. SFT is out.